the setting is the difference. The work mm -hmm. is not. I'm going to tailor the work based off the population, bringing the population to the table because they are the experts of their community. Program planning one-on-one, -on -one, they are the experts of their community. Welcome to The Optimized Workplace. I'm your host, Fran Dean Bishop, where our conversations with influencers, change makers, and VPs are really working to upset and change the whole conversation when it comes to the workplace. Today, I have the opportunity and the pleasure to interview and to have with us Shante Elbert, who is a contributing faculty member of the College of Health Professions within the PhD program of health education and promotion. She can tell us a little bit more about herself, but she's doing some fantastic work at The Ohio State University, where her portfolio includes counseling and consultative services, student health, and the Student Wellness Center. So she's over all of it, you all. She works with the recreation sports, the employing wellness for student life, and she also previously served as the Associate Dean of Health and Wellness at Central Washington University, where she provided supervision of disability services, counseling, and student health, as well as university recreation. So Dr. Elbert, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Fran. Nice to be here. Very nice to have you. I love your background. You have such a, a wide, I think, purview as to what's happening, and particularly in an area that we don't touch on as much as I think we really should, which is the collegiate environment and what's happening with our youth and what's happening with them around health and wellness. So maybe you can take us back a step. Since you are reaching into so many different areas with regards to that in education, how did you come to be in this field? And then we'll kind of delve in a little bit deeper. Well, I want to provide a quick update because I just left that position. Now, I'm still in Columbus, Ohio, but I'm the new chief health equity officer for the Columbus Public Health Department and their new section chief for the Center for Public Health Innovation. So I just made a pivot out of higher ed, but I'm going to still answer your question. So I'm doing a much more expansive role, um, similar to what I was doing in higher ed, but focusing on all of the citizens here in Columbus, about a million uh, community members and focusing around health mm -hmm. equity, specifically racial health equity um, around uh, what's uh, considered what we call health disparities in uh, making life not thrive as much for certain populations based off systemic and structural racism. And so um, I've just kind of pivoted out um, into this role. I just hit 90 days um, into that role. And so- Oh my word. Yes. Um, and I, I was doing health equity work in my previous roles because, you know, working with college age students, you know, not every student has access to um, the ability to attend an institution of higher education, whether it's a two year junior college or four year institution. And so um, that's why you have first gen generation students. That's why you have um, students who are moral scholars um, or those who are Pell eligible students. And those students meet the, the need based mm -hmm. scholarships and grants. Um, just based off socioeconomic status. Um, then we have students who are um, wards of the state, and they get also specific uh, grants and scholarships based off being aging out of the system. And so we see all of that matriculate into the higher education system also. And so I went into the field because I wanted to go into the helping field. Uh, I knew I wanted to help. Um, once I got out of the athletic training major, I was like, what do I want to do? And so I fell in love with health education and promotion because the premise of that is that if we give everybody all the information by your choice, by your yes. beliefs, you can make a decision based off what you feel will be best for you. Um, and that's based off valid, verifiable information. And so yeah. once I learned that I didn't have to be the expert for a person, mm -hmm. I can be the expert around information and give it to them in a way that they could receive it, and that's around health literacy, then I could do that all day. And I could talk about a variety of topics. Um, and if I could do it in higher ed, which is um, at that time my favorite area because I, I got to talk to people at my age group. Um, so in undergrad, I was a peer educator. So I got to talk to my peers around all the topics that were fun, sexual health, stress and time management, mental health. Um, and so I was like, I can do this as a career. Oh, this yeah. is... This is all the things. And so I made it a career choice. And so for 16 That's years- That's amazing. I, that I is amazing. Work. And you know, I love the fact that, again, you have such a wide purview as to what's happening. Let's kind of, um, kind of zero in on Columbus particularly. So in a person in your position, obviously you're seeing lots of different disparities, as you mentioned before, um, 
inequalities when it comes to health services, the delivery of those health services, and the groups that need it most. And here at Aerobodies, you know, we work a lot with behavioral health and on the front lines of supporting what's happening, you know, out in the communities, particularly here in the Washington, D.C. area. So can you kind of walk us through in your role, how do you all really decide what are the areas or what are the uh, the, uh, populations that you're looking to impact first and foremost? And then how do you grow your programs from there? So most uh, health departments, whether they're state, city, county, um, we do some type of health improvement uh, assessment, needs assessment, and that data informs how we should um, approach our programs, projects, those type of things. Um, and, and we do that by disaggregating the data. And so we yeah. base it off of, you know, race, um, race, ethnicity, age, those type of things. And so because the data kind of tells us uh, a glimpse into the population, that's one aspect of it. We also look at trends within our data um, as far as um, one thing I love about Columbus is that all the hospital systems, all of the federal qualified healthcare care um, spaces and the health departments, our county and our city here, they meet and they talk about what's trending in our healthcare spaces. And so there's another data set, you know, pulling from your EHRs, EMRs. And then we have our frontline staff. Um, who bring in that kind of qualitative anecdotal information of what's actually happening boots on the ground. A lot of times that doesn't always show up in our data because we know what populations of color are those who may be first generation here in America. We call it um, new native America, uh, new natives to uh, America. They don't always answer truthfully um, on surveys, sure. sometimes based off of fear. And that's a cultural based component. And so okay. we take all of those pieces to help, help guide us um, and charge us. And so within my uh, my team, the Center for Public Health Innovation, we have um, liaisons that represent the diversity of Columbus. So we have an AAPI coordinator, we have an LGBTQ coordinator, an African-American coordinator, we have a um, Bhutanese coordinator, we also have Arabic and then also with our Muslim population, and then we have religious. And so because all of them are, that is their personal identity and their expertise um, as far as uh, their degrees, they also represent the community liaisons. And so their public health background, that's their personal lived experiences, they also serve in those roles to go get that qualitative information and help make sure we tailor the work that we're trying to do for the community. And then vice versa, the community may say, hey, we are having these issues. We need your help. Can you do this for our community? So it is a Two-way street. I love it. Actually, I was taking notes as you were speaking because I think that, you know, we have an audience that's really wide and broad, some from the government public sector, as you mentioned, but many from commercial and private industry. And then we have leaders who are in health, but more importantly, CEOs and organizations where they're looking for, um, again, some of the latest and greatest trends around how you actually tackle some of these bigger challenges. And what we see a lot and what we hear back from our clients quite a bit is, you know, how are we tackling mental health or the challenges people are having around work from home and remote work, no matter what the population is, right? So I made some notes and I, I hope that everybody can take this in, no matter what audience you're coming from or what set of, of um, demographics or where you sit in the country. She mentioned assessing. I always start with an assessment, which I love that Dr. Elbert, that Start with an assessment of what's happening with your current population and what you want to do, even if you're in a gov- in a corporate environment. Then you look at the trend analysis, right? So what's happening with the data that you receive? Then you mentioned collaboration. I want to come back to that collaboration and co-creation because I think that's huge, right? It's not just yes, enough sure. to have one person in charge, but I loved how you mentioned after the analysis that you have these liaisons that go into the community, that they mirror the community by who they represent. And that's how they're able to get buy-in from community. You can do the same thing in a corporate environment, right? So who are the different uh, subgroups that are in that organization so that people feel represented? And we talk a lot about wellness committees and wellness champions, but that's exactly what you're talking about in a public health arena. And then finally, you mentioned the quality custom solution, which Hands down, it is not one size fits all. So you have to have a custom solution. I want to come back to that. And then finally, how you tailor that. Let's unpack that a little bit. You've worked in the university side. You've worked in the education side. Now you're on the public health side of the lens. What does co-creation and collaboration look like from your standpoint? 
it's looked the same, whether I was doing the public health work in higher ed or the public health work now in an actual public health setting. Um, I always uh, emphasize to my students who I'm teaching, um, the setting is the difference. The work mm -hmm. is not. And so I'm going to tailor the work based off the population. And so bringing the, the population to the table, because they are the experts of their community, is what I learned in my first health education and promotion class, program planning one-on-one. -on -one. They are the experts of their community. And please don't kind of go in as the savior complex that you have mm -hmm. all the research and the, the information for them. You can inform them with permission, give them this information and, and help inform the practice or the program or the project. But you should be going in there to co-create and more serve as a consultant to the community, giving them the tools and making sure you do it from a place that is sustainable after we leave. What we saw in public health practices is that we kind of came in, set up this big project program, we left and it wasn't sustainable because the community didn't have buy-in. And so mm -hmm. if you do it the opposite way and have them at the table and have those champions from the community say, no, this is actually what we need and find a way to blend what we're trying to do and teach them how to be the champions of the program, the project, um, and they can sustain the program even after uh, maybe some of us who are the experts coming in from the health department or any other entity leave. And I think mm -hmm. about some of the success rates with, especially for African-American women with breast cancer um, and, and, and testicular uh, t cancer and colon cancer, when they mm -hmm. involve the black church, uh, we've seen it with the barbershops, with African-American men and mental health conversations and also uh, health and wellness checks. They meet to the places where they are provided the education, talk to those barbers, talk to those hairstylists, talk to those clergy and those uh, and liaise with them and gave them the resources, took a step back and let them co-create it based off their spaces. And so that's what we've seen be very, very successful because mm -hmm. we let them do it in their place and space based off what they thought would be best for their community. And they have been successful. The research is tried and true. And now we're trying to see the same thing in the mental health sector. And mm -hmm. I think what makes mental health so different is that mental health intersects with everything else, just like the intersectionality. And so we've seen some success rates with substance abuse with the peer-to-peer -peer approach. Mm -hmm. Mental health has to be the same thing. And one of the reasons why I've been very vocal about making sure we don't paint a wide brush around mental health, because especially with communities of color, and English as a second language, we don't view mental health the same way. When you look at the, when they fill out a survey or DSM, we're not answering the questions the same way as the majority population at the moment, which is Caucasian white communities. And so we have to make sure that we just don't ask anecdotal questions. In the past 30 days, have you felt low? Well, a good portion may say yes. Mm -hmm. We have to do subsequent questions to get to the root. And I'm from the South. So we're going to get some root work in here, get to the root <laughs> of what's actually impacting our community. So that yeah. way we don't just keep peeling off the bandaid, trying to help it versus actually doing as we, you know, my mom's a nurse, doing open wound care and mm -hmm. packing it and healing it up from, from the root. And so my concern around some of the work that has been done and why I approach the work from a very holistic population level is that you need to do root work and not just leaf work. And that is how you actually do it uh, with the community is that they can tell you what is the root cause analysis, as we say in public health, but the root work, yeah. which is really impacting the community. The kids are not just acting up in school. They're hungry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Parent may have been incarcerated. Yeah. Opioid crisis. It may be a contingency of things around those social determinants of health or basic needs not mm -hmm. being met. But we see in the classroom, K-12, higher ed, tears, yeah. nomadic behavior, you know, inappropriate behavior. And, and I, so, I just want to make sure that we pause for a moment, Dr. Elbert, because you're giving so many nuggets that I think people can not only learn from, but really valuably find ways to, to actually implement themselves, right, in their own programs, no matter what program. And I can't say this enough, no matter what lens or hat you wear. I love the idea around being your own agent of change and being a consultant to people's health as opposed to a conduit. I like to say conduit to it. their health as opposed to owning it. You cannot own someone else's health. I cannot get well for you and you cannot get well for me, right? I cannot exercise for you. So why in the world would I try to label and decide for you what's the best way in which Absolutely. to approach that? That's exactly what you're saying, right? Absolutely. Um, in, in, in very simplistic terms. And I think that that can be applied 
no matter what kind of organization, where you come from, private versus public health programming, whatever you, hat you wear, as I said before, it's so important that you see that. See yourself as a conduit of that agent of change as opposed to giving someone exact, because if you tell them exactly what to do, then you're not allowing them to have the agency and people need to have the agency of their health. So I love that piece. And I also love the piece where you said that you're finding ways to have very um, didactic, but also um, baseline conversations with people around mental health. Because what mental health looks like in different populations of people is incredibly different. I too am a woman of color. I come from a culturally diverse background. But, you know, many of my colleagues are not. And so what that conversation looks like and how we access that or how we even talk about it could be very different. And so being able to be willing to have that conversation is fantastic. So I want to pivot a little bit because I think that having you on, you know, obviously you have such a huge lens, as I've said before, but, you, you know, obviously being a doctor in this area and having your doctorate in this area, you're also... I think a game changer, right? And and a trend hunter in many ways in terms of what's coming up. So we're sitting on the, the precipice of the new year, 2024. Yes. As that comes, as we're, you know, kind of going around the bend and you're looking out 2024, what are you looking forward to the most in terms of this new role, you know, new opportunity in uh, the city of Columbus and just in general, and when it comes to health and well-being for the constituents that you represent? I am so excited about the opportunity to do programming much more um, definitively. Now that we have a, a, a Center for Public Health Innovation, now that, you know, two years ago, our mayor said racism is a, a structure of public health crisis. Now we've built the structures. We're doing some strategic planning at the first of the year to actually, as we say, put some feet on um, our new center. And so I'm so excited about actually being able to go up to our community and be able to say, this is what we can offer to you all um, with our capacity building team. This is what our community engagement team can do. And these are the policies from our policy team, policy and research team, that we'll be working with our legislators to move forward to support our community. And so I'm excited to be able to have that elevator speech once we put you know, the bow tie on our strategic planning process. And so as a, as a leader who loves strategy, I'm excited to actually go through our strategy process at the first of two full weeks of January. That's all we'll be doing the first two weeks is fine tuning our strategy, making sure our mission, vision, our values, goals align to the larger Columbus public health. So that way we can be very distinct, you know, to our community and our constituents on what we can do and what we hope to do in the future Mm -hmm. with more resources and time. And then unfortunately what we can't do because based off limitations and capacity, I'm yeah. really excited about that. And, and I've learned over time that the clearer we can be about what we are and what we are not, mm-hmm. it really helps guide us in our practice. When it comes to the larger conversation outside of just my role here, health equity has become such a larger conversation. And it's, I'm happy right now that it's much more palpable as you know, they kind of criminalize the whole diversity, equity, inclusion conversation. Our uh, health equity is still quite palpable and open to discussion. And I'm, I'm really excited to see how on a larger scale, we're seeing our health insurance companies, our public and private um, healthcare organizations start to center health equity. My position is new, but it's, it's growing. I see chief health equity officer positions growing across the country. So Mm -hmm. I'm really excited to see what's going to happen nationally around this conversation around health equity and how we start to center those who are under-resourced, historically minoritized, um, and how all the isms are impacting our communities. And Mm -hmm. so on a larger scale, I'm really excited about that. And I'm hoping that our national organizations, professional organizations are looking at the um, the academic side uh, mm-hmm. and starting to change the curriculum to match uh, the, the community that they have to serve so that the new professionals who will replace us are better prepared to do this work. I love the fact that you are setting the tone going into the new year and what the strategy is going to look like, right? And you mentioned the programming because I think we've gotten so apt to death, I like to say, and technology to death that we're <laughs> using technology and apps to replace conversations. And when it comes to health, uh, you know, I, I, I just recently had this uh, situation happen to me where I had to have an emergency laser surgery on my eyes. They found uh, two torn retinas or two tears on the left side and then a, 
a partial detachment on the right eye. So you can imagine that was not something that I would want to have some sort of computer program spit out to me. That was a real conversation. It mm -hmm. meant immediate surgery. And I was, you know, I was really quite anxious about it. So again, health is the same way. And I think mental health is even even more so, right? We're seeing the the suicide rates go up. We're seeing depression after COVID, people being in these remote work environments. So all of that takes the the need of communication and having real experts and counselors that are available. And I love the fact that you are willing to invest in the programming because I think that's going to be a huge proponent. And, and it's interesting. I don't know if you see this from your lens, but I've been in, in health and wellness for almost 30 years now. Hopefully I don't look like it, but I have, no, right? Not at all. Um, I started at when all. I was two. I started when I was two. And it's interesting how we go through these various cycles of programs or product rollout, you know, back in, in the early 2000s, it was all these technology. And so we see a plethora of apps, right, around coaching and counseling and mindfulness. And I was speaking to somebody on my team earlier this morning, and we were talking about the fact that, you know, even with that, we're still seeing with clients that we sit down with, they're like, but what do you have for us for mental health? How can you help us address the disparity that we're facing around mental health and how we do that better? Which to me, says exactly what you're saying, Doc, around programs. Mm -hmm. Because the apps, there's a lot of apps out there, but they're not solving the problem. And that's not how people really want to deal with it. If they were, then we'd be fine because there are millions of apps now, right, to address this, but we're still at the starting block. So you mentioned the Center for Public Health there in Columbus. You also mentioned capacity building that you're working on, which is fantastic. And um really working on community engagement. And if you can just spend just a, just a couple moments as we kind of round out this conversation around the community engagement piece, because I think having a better understanding of how you're approaching that is something our audience could really benefit from because engagement is an ongoing effort, right? It never stops. So do you want to share a little bit about that? So one of the things I love about our community engagement team um, during the summer when there's all the festivals and all the um, larger outdoor engagement opportunities. They're there. They're at the. T they're tabling. They're they're out there with the community. Um, but more so, um, they're part of the community's uh, organization. So some of them have boards. Some of them have organizations. So they go to those meetings. They're present and here, um, taking notes, listening. And so it's a, like again, it's a two way street of making sure that we're front and center and present. So we're not just coming in asking for things, but we're also taking in and receiving things at the same time. Um, the community engagement team also is the holder of um, one of our grant funds. And so if some of the, the organizations that's registered through the city um, need some small funding for, uh, I call it uh, small grant funding to help with uh, some of the outreach and programming that they're trying to do for their community. Um, so like, for instance, one of the organizations was doing a turkey drive and they just needed a couple hundred dollars to help round out what they wanted to do. They applied for the grant, they got the grant. And so we, the community engagement team also uh, solicits organizations if we don't, uh, if we're getting close to not being able to give out the money, they work with the organizations on how to fill out the paperwork for the city, which you know can be cumbersome. Mm -hmm. um, and, walk, and we walk them through that process so they become a vendor in the city's process. So not only can they get money from us, but if there's another opportunity to apply for something for the city, they're already in the system. And so I love that this community engagement team is just front and center. And for them, it's personal. This mm -hmm. is their community. This is this is them. And so I think sometimes when I'm teaching students and they're like, well, Dr. E, what do I do if that is not my identity? Take your seat, listen and glean. I don't always represent the communities that I am serving, um, especially in the work that I've done, but I can be a listener and I can ask questions for clarity and I can always do the most important thing, which is to follow back up. A lot of times we come in, we listen, take notes and say a lot of things, but we don't follow up and we don't follow up in with action. And so I think that's so important for those who are doing the work. They don't represent the communities that they are going to do the work with. Follow back up with action. And if you can't, explain, still educate on um, why something can't be done, why something may be cumbersome or may take more time than we thought it would be. The fact that we often just say no, or it just can't happen, or it's not done yet without the extra, like almost like do it as I say, not as I do. Don't mm -hmm. ask no questions. It tears the relationship apart. So I think the community engagement part is the most pivotal piece. It centers the, the work. Uh, and if you don't have that relationship, 
it really breaks down the level of communication. And when there is a crisis, i.e. COVID, it really creates challenges on making sure that we can get them to the table. Bravo. I think that's a fantastic place to end. I love how you wrap that in. And engagement is having those stakeholders, right? No matter what the organization, what the community, making sure you have stakeholders that people can really believe in and partner with and trust, right? We talk a a lot about that. We have a program called Well Team Culture, and we talk a lot about that. You have to find those stakeholders that want to meaningfully drive change in the the organization and community. So thank you so much, Dr. Ebert. This has been a fantastic, it goes by so quickly. These calls go by so quickly, but I love it because I always learn something new. I think it's fascinating. I love the work that you're doing there in Columbus, and I'm sure everybody's so excited to have you on board leading and championing public health for that or that community. So keep up the fantastic work and thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Fran. And thank you for joining us today for the Optimized Workplace. I'm your host, Fran Dean Bishop. And remember, it's many that small monumental moments that make the biggest difference in your life. Take care. Have a great day, everyone.